Hey guys, God bless you, welcome, thank you for joining me today, I hope that this finds you well and uh, I just want to encourage you, don't forget you can go on to Effective Life Church website and uh, you can find out all the details about Effective Life Church, what we stand for, what we're about, where we're going, what our heart is and if you'd like to be a part of that please, please have a look at the website. Uh, if you're a member of the church, don't forget, use the website to catch up on the video teachings. And also you can look into my ministry at Effective Life Ministry. Okay, so you can go to that website, Effective Life Ministry website, and you can find out more about my heart and my ministry. So bless your heart. Uh, you can go on YouTube, of course, don't forget that, and uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram and all these different things. And uh, so I just, I just pray that you take that opportunity to tap in to what God has for you out of all of that media. Well, today I'm excited because we're going to start a brand new series and uh, it's on one of the fathers of our faith, as it were, Abraham, whose prefix is, or his name, Father Abraham. So we're going we're gonna to dive into this series and we're really going to try and break it down put it apart, what was God saying to Abraham, which was exclusive to Abraham and some of the prophecies, what was more of a generalised prophecy to God's people, and what are the principles that even the church can follow and promises that we can tap into as well. So we're going to journey with Abraham over the next few weeks, and uh, I just pray that it will bless you. Uh, Abraham is a great character and he just really is somebody that you can uh, admire, you can learn lessons from, you can grow in your own relationship with God and understanding just through seeing uh, what Abraham was about and how he handled things. Some things he did great and like many of us some things he did not so great. So part one is the call of Abraham, the call of Abraham, okay? So today we're going to start that looking at Genesis and chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to jump in at th verse 31. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31. And you will see how alive the Old Testament actually is today and how we are blessed and can grow through it. Uh, Genesis 31 and it's uh, chapter 11 verse 31. So Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chandeliers to go to Cana. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived for 205 years, and then he died in Haran. Now some scholars believe uh, that Ur was now, today, uh, in southern Iraq, uh, the Babylonia, and archaeologists have also found lots of archaeological evidence for civilization in that area around the time of Abraham. Uh, Ur was the home of astronomy and astrology, uh, it was a trading point so it was not a tiny town, it wasn't a village, but actually it was quite a big uh, thriving town. And uh, it had one of the biggest libraries was in uh, that area as well, that was discovered years later. It's thought that Abraham was well educated. And this was uh, found to, to roughly about 1900 years before the birth of Christ. So. Uh, we discover Abraham and we meet him as he's leaving uh, Ur and he's setting out on this journey. Uh, what do we know about his father? Well, his father lived, as we said, for 205 years. He was a descendant of Shem, one of Noah's sons who were on the ark with him. And Joshua 24, too, says, uh, Joshua said to all of the people, this is what the Lord the God of Israel says, Long ago your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and uh, Noah, 
lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. So Terah worshipped foreign gods. Um, some commentaries note that he actually worshipped uh, in Mesopotamia and the main one of the main gods there that they would worship was the moon god and his name was Sin, uh, ironically. So they worshipped the moon god called Sin but in actual fact in that culture and in that place it would have been a, a real mishmash of uh, different people coming from all over the Middle East bringing in all their different cultures, their different gods, and very much so people exchanged their gods depending on the need that they had. So if it was a financial need, they'd be looking for the god of finance. If it was uh, for grain, they'd be looking for the god of the soil. If it was for to make the land fruitful instead of barren, they'd be looking for the sun god or the rain god and all these different things. And none of it was relational and even today you know Christianity is one of the only relational relationships with our God. There are lots of different religions that have lots of different gods but Christianity is about a relationship with God and there is no other God other than Yahweh, other than Jehovah Jireh and it's a relational relationship and none of these other religions at the time of Abraham had this. This was totally uncommon. It, there was a deity with this big distance that you never really heard or anything like that. It was more like good luck charms. Or if we appease the gods then things will go well with us. But with God, Jehovah, it wasn't about appeasing him. God created Adam for relationship with him, not to be a robot that just obeyed him, although obedience is crucial in our walk, obviously, but it's so much more than just obedience. If it was based on just obedience, Adam blew it, and that's the end, because it wasn't obedient. But a relationship based on so much more than just that. So terror worshipped foreign gods and we don't know how many there were but he wasn't worshipping the god of the Israelites or who the Israelites would become. Originally the name terror in Hebrew means wild goat, wild goat, okay. But later on it also gained the meaning of delay or station, either delay or station as one of the places in uh, the, the Israelites stopped in their exodus of Egypt going to the promised land. Now isn't it amazing the meaning that it became from wild goat to delay or station. Okay, And we have to be careful what is causing the delay, what is causing us to be stationary, still stopped. And we'll look a, a little bit uh, more into that. Uh, we are not told why Terah settled in Haran instead of continuing to Cana. Uh, it could have been ill health, it could have been cultural, it could have been that it was a great marketing business place. And sometimes God will equip you with stuff and the stuff becomes the distraction. Okay, But the stuff was just to equip you. Okay, Sometimes we can gain businesses, sometimes we can gain home, sometimes we can gain uh, finances, sometimes we can gain certain relationships and they're there to equip you forward on what God's, God has got for you but they can very easily become a sticking point. You don't get past what God had intended. He didn't intend for you to stay in that business. He didn't intend you. It was for a season. And now you need to move on to the next one. For anything in this world to be healthy, it needs seasons, not a season. Okay? It needs several. If it just rained all the time, guess what? Everything will die off. Because it'd be flooded, it'd be washed away, all the minerals get washed out of the soil, so on and so forth. If it was just sunshine all the time, it'd become barren. Okay? We need a season. Okay, and sometimes in our life we can get stuck in one season. Okay, and we need seasons, and sometimes we can become reluctant to move. 
a bit like a donkey. When a donkey don't want to do something, man alive, you ain't going to get it to do it. And, and God described the Israelites time and time again as a stiff-necked donkey. He said, you're, you're stubborn. Won't move. Come on. And you try and move, and it will not move. It, it puts its feet. You know, my little dog does the same. At night, I say to him to go to bed, or during the day, I say to him, come on, you need to go out for a wee. And if, he's, if he don't want to go, that's it. He just puts his leg like that, and you literally have to pick him up to get him out the door. Okay, now the danger is God calls us into wonderful seasons, but sometimes we stay too long. Sometimes the seasons pass, and we begin to fall behind. Sometimes... Things change in our lives. Delay comes in and causes us to be stationary. So we have to be careful. Uh, now, the name Abram means exhorted father, which is ironic because his wife Sarai was barren. She was barren, but yet his name means exhorted father. Now God, just like with Gideon, calls us which we are not at that point in time, but what we are going to be. Amen. He said, Gideon, come out, you mighty man of valour, meaning you great warrior. But he wasn't. He was a yellow-bellied chicken with a chip on his shoulder about his past and his family. I'm not good enough. We're the weakest. All these different things. You know the story. But God called him for which he was going to be. Jesus said to Peter, you're the rock. Well, upon this revelation you've received, I will build my church. And Peter was known as the rock. Okay? But was he at that time? Well, no, he was interchangeable. He, he confused. And Jesus rebuked him. He tries to rebuke Jesus. He denies Christ three times. He, three times. He was hardly a rock. He was like the, you know, a reed in the wind being blown everywhere. He weren't really a rock. But what did he become? He became the world. And right now you might not feel, your lifestyle might not be, your circumstances might not be what you want them to be, to reflect where you feel you're going. You think, well, how can I be? How can this be my calling when my circumstances are saying this? And I'm there and I've been there. But you have to keep going. But you cannot walk by sight. You cannot walk by circumstances. You have to keep walking according to the calling. Ephesians 4 verse 1. We have to walk according to the calling of which we have been called. And so God was calling this man, exhorted father, yet he had no children. His wife was barren. Don't you just love it? There's hope for us. You can look at your life and say, well, things aren't this and things aren't that and things aren't the other. What joy. You know, you can even look at your age and say, I wish I'd achieved this for Christ. I wish I'd done that for Christ. I wish I'd done this with my life and that. Do you know what? Stop wishing and hoping. Brush yourself down. This year, make some plans to do it. There's no retirement in Christ and neither is there redundancy. Your retirement years can be the most fruitful years in your life for the kingdom of God. You are usable. You know, a lot of churches, they're looking for young families to recruit or evangelise, whatever you want to say, be it part of the church. Why? Because they bring finances, they bring energy, they bring enthusiasm and their giftings are... You know, they're, they're, they're mustard, as they say. They're really good. They're really hot. And they're current with technology and all these things. You know, God looks not at the outside, but he looks at the heart. And you might be watching today. You might be in your 50s, 60s, 70s or 80s. Do you know what? We'd love to have you. You are precious in the sight of God. You are valuable. You have a whole bag load of giftings to offer the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Any family is, is, is healthy when it's got young and old and we're of equal value and importance in the family of God. 
You know, you've got to remember the age Abraham was when he got called out, 75. You know, we ain't wanting to go on a journey when we're 75. We're ready to park up and go, go back to heaven, as it were. So I encourage you. So Genesis 11, verse 30, says, Now Sarai, whose name means contentious, was barren and had no children. Now we can see the meaning of that name later on because you see how she contends with Abraham. She even contends with the Lord. She mocks Abraham. She mocks God over the prophecies that they're given. Now it doesn't say uh, biblically why Abraham's father decided to move from Ur with Abraham, Sarai and Lot. But we know that by then God had already called Abraham. We can see this looking at Genesis 12 verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household and go to a land I will show you. It says, and the Lord said, okay, so the Lord had told Abraham and, you know, a lot of the time God causes, calls us into things or out of things and we can just be so reluctant to move. Now this was tough for Abraham because, you know, like we all do, you weigh up the cost. You think, well, you know, this is my age, this is my income, this is my home, this is my family, these are my responsibilities. This is the area I've grown up in. This is where I was planning X, Y, and Z. And then God comes in on the page and turns the whole thing upside down. See, and often we can become very secure in our surroundings, you know? Yet God, time and time again, can end up calling us out of that that is secure to us. Because a lot of the time we put our security in what's familiar. And we forget to trust the Lord. You know, we tie ourselves up. We're so tied down to this, to that, to the other things that for a lot of people, if they wanted to do something for the Lord, they couldn't do it anyway because they've tied themselves up so much. And I just want to encourage you, don't be so tied up that you can't obey God. And often God will ask us to do, which we know often that that we don't want to. I'm sure Abram, at the age of 75, was not planning to become a wanderer. He wasn't planning to do what God was asking him to do. Another confirmation of this is in Acts chapter 7 and verse 2. Acts chapter 7 verse 2. To this he, Stephen, the uh, apostle, replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham whilst he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Iran. Leave your country, leave your people, God said, and go to a land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chardonnays and he sat out and settled in Iran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. So we see that for Abram, it was a massive upheaval, what was going on. Notice as well, just by the by, uh, this is one of the rare occurrences where in the New Testament, when one of the New Testament writers is writing, that he actually addresses the brothers and fathers. And most of the time it's addressed to my little children, to my brothers, to my loved ones. But in this situation, he addresses the fathers as well. Because as you get older, it's harder to move. You settle. You want security. It's a natural part of us. But often in God, God says, well, your security is in me. And I want you to move. So he's called to leave his culture, to leave his family. And the big one for me is 
and go to a land I will show you. So it doesn't get shown beforehand. He has to step out blind. He has to leave not knowing the exact location he's going to. Now that's powerful, church. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Even for us uh, charismatic Christians, often we're doing something radical for the Lord, but we know generally where we're going, what country we're going to, what the travel arrangements are, uh, we've, we've provided for the journey, hopefully, so on and so forth. But Abraham doesn't even know where he's going. Well, what do I need? What am I going to take? What am I going to leave? But yet, he obeys the Lord. God appeared to Abraham in earth and told him to leave, uh, which he did. He left with Sarai, he left with his nephew, he left with his father. However, Abraham and his family settled in Haran for a time. It was only once Terah, his father, passed away that they fully obeyed God and continued to journey to Cana, which was the land God was then showing him. God had only called Abram, by the way. He didn't call a mass of people to come out of the land. Isaiah 51 verse 2. Look to Abraham your father and Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. And you know sometimes there's a lot of Christians who feel disappointed in the word of God. And they're disappointed because they're claiming some of the promises in the word of God that weren't for them. They were for the individual in that setting, in that circumstances, for God will to come about generally, normally, for the people of Israel. And then what charismatics do, of which I'm one, we take that promise and we apply it to ourselves and then we're disappointed that it's not coming to fulfilment. And we then begin to struggle with disappointment in God because he's not doing what he promised. Disappointed in ourselves because we don't think we've got the faith to receive what God had promised us. And it becomes a bit of a mess. Now what you can't do is take individual prophecy and apply it widely. Yes, you can take the character of God and the principles of God and apply them widely. But you can't take individual prophecy and apply widely because it was a prophecy for that person to bring about God's will in that time, in that culture, in those circumstances. You know, and a lot of us are walking with hope deferred because we're trying to apply to ourselves that which God promised or spoke to somebody else. But we're trying to apply it to us. So we've become disillusioned and disappointed. Eventually we're disheartened and, you know, we, we, we begin to struggle and backslide. And we feel God has let us down. Our relationship with God is then hindered. Because you're trying to apply something that was never meant for you. Okay? And it's a bit like trying to put on the wrong pair of shoes. Yes, the promise is, I'll give everyone shoes. Great, wonderful. That doesn't mean to say I can take my wife's shoes and wear them. They won't fit. They won't look right. They won't be comfortable. My size is about three times bigger than hers. And if you think I can walk in high heels, you've got another thought coming. Those days are over, baby. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? Now, the principle of having shoes, yes, absolutely. But I can't take other people's and sometimes we're trying to take other people's promises and apply them to ourselves and then we're disillusioned and fed up because it's not what... Do you understand where I'm coming from? Joshua 24 verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Noah, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Cana and gave him many descendants. So it says that his father worshipped other gods. 
You know, and one of Abraham, uh, one of Joshua things later on, he says, uh, "As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord." And he challenges us and said, "You know, if you want to serve the gods beyond the river, then so be it. Go worship that that is old." But he said, "As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord and Him, him only." And that's been one of my most uh, favourite scriptures for my household, and I'm blessed for my children and being in a relationship with God and, and my wife, so on and so forth, and I'm thankful. Abraham is known as God's friend, Isaiah 41 verse 8. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, who I have chosen, you are descendants of Abram, my friend. Isn't that wonderful? Can you imagine having that prefix? to your name, the friend of God. What does that imply? Well, it implies relationship. It implies closeness, friendship. I had the, uh, the great joy this week of reconnecting with an old friend of mine, a pastor. And, you know, years ago, uh, there, there was a real connecting of hearts and uh, a connection of vision and so on and so forth. But circumstances and different things, the enemy gets in and we kind of just drifted apart, really. And it was really great this week to just reconnect with him and kind of just get right back on track and say, OK, what does God want to do using us two for the kingdom? What, what has he got in store? And it's really lovely when that happens. And uh, he's a friend and we could just pick up that friendship again. You know, and God describes Abraham as a friend. Well, that means there was a relationship. Wonderful. Another translation describes Abraham as the one who loved me. Isn't that lovely? God was convinced of Abraham's love for him. It's really, really beautiful. So Abraham knew God and he was in a relationship with God. If God asked you to do something, would you recognise it? Would you hear the, the voice of God? Is there enough relationship? you to hear the voice and the heart of God. To leave one's family, again, meant leaving one's security, friends, and so on and so forth, to become vulnerable, because the opposite to vulnerability is what? Security. And we find our security in what is around us, but sometimes God calls you out. And not only did he call him out, but he was calling me into something. And you've got to remember, when God calls you out, he's not going to abandon you in the wilderness. He's calling you into something. And sometimes we don't want to be called out because we think we're going to be in the wilderness. But God's not going to abandon you. He might take you through the wilderness, but he won't leave you there. Because why? He's taking you into something. And sometimes we don't know what that something is. And that's the faith walk. That's the radical faith walk. We don't know what the future holds sometimes. You know, sometimes we want a prophecy or prophetic word before we're moved. Well, where's the faith in that then? Where's the faith if you need a prophetic word to tell you to do it? In one sense, if you understand where I'm coming from, well, you know, where's, where's the faith? Sometimes we've just got to walk on the water and trust God in the situation. Know that he's called you out. Not only has he called you out, he's also called you in. When Terah died, Abraham's father, Abraham became the father of the family. Suddenly, he had a whole load of responsibility. And sometimes we can hide behind responsibility. Now, I'm not saying be irresponsible. I'm not saying that. But sometimes we can use responsibility is an excuse not to step out and it's not really because of a sense of responsibility it's because of a sense of security you know i remember years ago uh, i had the opportunity to study in south africa and it meant leaving the uk it meant uh, leaving the ministry i was involved with at the time it meant leaving friends it meant leaving family and what was very difficult was, at the time, my mother had been diagnosed with cancer. 
and it meant leaving my mother. And that was a real challenge, it was really hard. And I know some people didn't understand it. And people would be saying, well, what are you going to? What does five years time look like? And I kept saying, well, I don't know. I don't know. But what about your children? What about your wife? What about this? What about that? And, you know, I probably looked a bit foolish because I just kept saying, but I don't know. I just know God, this is a part of God's plan. I don't know the full length of the journey, but I know right now this is a step he wants me to take. And my dear mother, I, uh, I met with my mother and she was a wonderful Christian woman. She loved the Lord. And I shared with her and I said, you know what, I know you've got this diagnosis. I know what's going on. But I don't believe that you will pass away without me being there. And if I don't go, the only reason I'm not going to go is because I want to support you and be there if you pass away. If I go, that is saying, do you know what, I can go with the confidence because I know God will keep and sustain you because I have a promise from God that I will be there when you pass away. Do you know what? I went 6,000 miles to South Africa, stayed, and then God moved in such a way that instead of being there for uh, two to three years, we were only there for two months. I came back and God worked in such a way. Do you know what? My mother moved in and stayed with me for the last two weeks of her earthly life. And I was able, with my wife and my siblings, to nurse her and love her and pray for her and be with her and so on and so forth. See, obedience. It's tough. It's hard. There's a price to pay. And some people were ticked off with me. How could you do that? How could you go when your mum's been diagnosed with that? You, you'll be out there and she's going to die, so on and so forth. You know, it's, a, it's tough. It's not popular sometimes. It doesn't work out. It doesn't come in line with reason. And Abraham would have been faced in this very situation. The voices around him. Saying, well, what's going on? Why is he making this decision? His dad done all this for him, set that up for him, and now he's going to blow his inheritance. Now he's going to do this. Now he's going to do that. And sometimes those around you just, just one won't, two can't understand what God is doing in your life. So Abraham now has a greater responsibility than he's ever had because he's inherited all his father's. Uh, uh, male, uh, male or female servants and household and stuff as well. It's the ancestral home now that he's leaving behind. God was saying to Abraham, I want you to leave all behind. I want you to leave all the security. I want you to leave all that you've known. I don't want you to hold anything back. And I want you to follow me. I want you to go where I'm telling you to go. And God moved upon Abraham. God moved upon his family. And he gave him the strength. And sometimes that's what we have to do. Notice when Peter got out of the boat, he said to Jesus, call me. Tell me to come to you. And when you know it's God, there's a confidence. Because you know God called you. You might not know the plan, but you know he called you, and that is my confidence. So sometimes we have to leave all behind, and that's the trouble. Sometimes we hold things dear, and some things are precious, and that's fine, and they're dear to us. Some things are just cling-ons. They're just dragging you down. You know, sometimes you can get stuck in a chapter of a book, and you can just get stuck in that chapter. And you can't move on. Or you get stuck in that book. And you can't move on to the next. You know, and God is sometimes saying, look, I'm doing a new thing. You don't need that what's on the left. You don't need that what's on the right. Because what you need lays ahead of you. You haven't seen what you need yet. And you're trying to take all this stuff with you. Yet for what I'm calling you to, you don't need that. 
what you need lies ahead of you. And sometimes we won't go unless we can take all that with us. And sometimes that might even be some relationships. Now, I'm not saying you break relationships, but there are some places God is taking you to that that right-hand man or left-hand man or right-hand woman or left-hand woman is not the right person to be with you in the next season. Yes, be a friend. Yes, stay in relationship. But they might not be where God wants you to go in the next step. In actual fact, the one who helped you on your last step might be the very one who hinders you in the next. Let me say that again. The one who helped you in your last step might be the very one who hinders you in the next. And so we have to really be in tune with God. And sometimes we, we, we're trying to drag with us those that aren't with us for the next part. Yes, they're friends, but they're not going to be involved in your ministry life. So Abraham had to leave all behind. Sometimes the stuff we have to leave behind are past failures. We won't move into the next step that God has for us because we feel we failed in the last step. But what if the last step wasn't God? You thought it was, but it wasn't. What if the last step which failed was God? Because God does allow us to face failure sometimes. God allowed David's enemies to triumph over him to get David back into a place where he needed to be. And I've experienced that very, very same thing. I've experienced a situation where weaknesses and people have triumphed over me. And in actual fact, God has used it for my good. And it actually got me into a better place than what I was before. But at the time, it appeared like failure. Now you've got to remember the cross at the time appeared like failure. A weeping John, a weeping Mary, weeping disciples, public people heartbroken, a broken Christ on the cross. How was this victory? How was this triumph over death when we see a corpse? Yet God used it. Hallelujah. Although it appeared to be defeat, it was actually a victory. And some of the things what can appear to be defeat in your life when you're struggling is actually shaping you, strengthening you, changing you, equipping you for the next part of the journey. Not every failure is a defeat. Amen? Not every failure is a defeat. It's not. Romans 8, 28, all things work for the good for those who are called. Abraham was called. You have been called and we have to respond. As I preached last week, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The Jesus asked the same of the disciples in Matthew 4, verse 18. Matthew 4, verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting nets into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now again we see something culturally that should not happen. They left their father. You don't do that. What are you doing in today's day and age? Yeah, people will do that. They will think twice about leaving their father's household to walk out without drop of a hat. But in this culture of honour, you don't leave your father's house. Yet, they left immediately to follow Jesus. See, if you debate it, you'll delay it. If you delay it, it'll end up stationary. You become a terror, father of Abraham. Delayed and still. 
Matthew 8, 21, another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own. Now, scholars believe that in actual fact, the father's death in this situation wasn't imminent as such, probably a couple of years. And, and the, the point is, you know, don't delay. Don't delay, you know. Let the dead bury their own. So as I said before, there's some, some people and some things we're waiting for to come into our life, to come with us, because that's what we're used to. And you're going to wait so long, you're going to delay, you're just going to be stationary, nothing's going to happen. Because oh, God is not chose them people to walk with you for the next season. Matthew 9, verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. What a lovely name, like that name. Saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. None of these disciples knew the destination. Jesus didn't sit down and, and write a proposition for them to go away and debate and think about and fast over and so on and so forth. He said, follow me. And they responded immediately. They followed. He didn't tell them the conditions that they'd be homeless, they'd be sleeping out most nights, <laughs> you know. He didn't tell them. And sometimes we want so much information from God first. I need another confirmation and another confirmation and another confirmation. We become the Gideon. Well, I put the fleece out and if it's dry, uh, it's you. I put the fleece out. If it's wet, then it's you. Or if I put the fleece out and it changes colour, what if it's slightly soggy? What if, what if, what if? And we're, we're, all we're doing, we're just delaying, delaying, delaying until eventually we realise we're still, and God realises, and he moves, moves on with somebody else. Yes, he still loves you, but he gets somebody else to fulfil his will because you won't move. You're an ass. You're that donkey. Don't be an ass. Yet these men didn't know the terms and conditions Abraham didn't know the terms and conditions. He called him out without telling him where he was calling him to. You know, but he just called him out and he said, well, we'll go. Isn't that the radical walk though? Isn't that the wonderful radical walk? Is it scary? Yes. Now, most of the things that require faith are scary. You know, because you don't have the information. you just got to trust God. And sometimes we can make our lives so comfortable that you actually don't have to trust God much anymore. Wow. I want to get into that, back to that radical faith walk. We trust in God. Trust in God. Sometimes God is trying to lead you into a place of greater service for him. Sometimes it's a place of less being less comfortable with less security, but it moves you closer into the very centre of his hand. Genesis 12 verse 2, Genesis 12 verse 2. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Wow, what a, what a going away present. <laughs> you know, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And you know, one thing I love about this text in this scripture, it says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. So the blessings coming to Abram. He's going to bless him. Abram's going to receive something. And the next line says, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Hallelujah. So he's being blessed to be a blessing. It's not, this isn't even about himself. This is about others. This is about God. Can you enrich somebody else's lifestyle? Can you change their day? Can you alter 
the DNA of their week or their thinking? Can you be a blessing? Can you do something in the way of encouragement to lift somebody's day, to brighten their day, to encourage them in some way? You might have to sacrifice something, time or finances or whatever it is, but you can be a blessing. Even in lockdown, you can be a blessing. You can be a blessing. Just because we're in lockdown doesn't mean that God is locked up. God is not locked up because we're in lockdown. Hallelujah. So you is blessed to be a blessing. And it says as well, whoever uh, blesses you, I will bless. But whoever curses you, I will curse. To curse someone is to, to wish them ill. And you might think, well, I've never done that. But yet, have you wished people ill? Wish that their ministries would fail? Wish that they'd be exposed for their sin? Wish that they'd get what they were deserved? I've been there. Don't know about you, I've been there. I have had my struggles with some people in life. But I thank God that he brought me through. Notice God says, I will. So Abraham's journey is not one about creating his own ministry and his own fame. God says, I will make you into a great nation. And a lot of the time we're trying to, to create our own fame, our own ministry and work it up ourselves and do it ourselves and try and think of all the ideas and so on so forth. And yet God says to Abraham, Abraham, you haven't got to send out a magazine of the week. You haven't got to send everybody an email every five minutes. You haven't got to do this, that and then. I will do it, says the Lord. Who's driving the car? Two people can't drive the car. Two people are fighting over the steering wheel. You're going to crash. Only one of you can drive the car. And who's driving yours? Is it you, the car of your life? Are you, or are you sitting back and saying, well, Lord, I'm going to trust you. This is how I would do it. But do you know what? Lord, I'm going to trust you. Help me to hear your voice. Help me to be patient. Notice God says, I will do it. He's the one who's going to do it and he's going to do it well and it's going to last and Abraham's not going to do it because Abraham will get the glory and if you do it, you'll get the glory. But God says, no, I want the glory, so I'm going to do it. And we must make sure that we give God the glory. He says, no man will steal my glory. Yet I've seen people's ministries be thrown down the toilet on all what God has done through them uh, because of personal feelings that people have. And you think of all the testimonies that took place that never get shared because somebody didn't like the person. We have to be very careful because what are you doing? Well, you're removing the glory from the testimony of what God did. Whether you like the person or not, God did it. And God deserves the glory. But you put a cap on the testimonies because you don't like the person. You stole God's glory. You said, no, no, because of my personal point of view on this note, sorry, Lord, you can't have the glory. I disapprove of that person you used. And we rob God of the glory. We need to be careful, church. God will use whoever he chooses. He used his spoke through a donkey. Well, that's up to God. It's up to God who he used. He used, used Rahab, a prostitute. He used, used all different sorts of people. They don't need your approval. And even today, it, they don't need your approval. It's between God and God who God uses. Hallelujah. I just need to make sure that we're in the right place. Now, God was moving forward for Abraham and preparing the way, but Abraham still had to do his bit. Abram had to be obedient. Abram had to move. Abram had to use faith. Abram had to take uh, his household with him. Abraham had a responsibility before God. Abram had to move. It didn't just materialise like on Star Trek where they say, beam me down, Scotty, and they suddenly appear at the next location. Abraham had to walk. He had to walk it out. And I'm sure there were many times he had doubts. Many times he would look back and say, oh, man, alive. 
if only we were back in the good old days. See, the problem with looking at the good old days, you miss out on the glory of today. And that's the problem. And you don't give God the glory for today. And you've got a lot to be thankful for. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on the earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. 75. <whistles> 75. Now, granted, they lived longer in those days, but shish kebab, 75. And so often we can look at our lives and say, I've missed the moment, it's over for me. My time's been and gone. I'm leaving it to the younger generation now to do their bit. And we kind of almost put ourselves up into a, to retirement, put my feet up in the kingdom. I've, I've done enough. I've done enough. I've done my bit, you know. And it didn't work like that with God. Why, you know, man alive, let your relationship with God continue to be a roller coaster. Let it continue to be an adventure in faith. Yes, he may use you. It might not be in the same way. You know, it might not be. But let him use you. Be available. At 75 years old, Abram steps out of the boat. He would have to have his eyes fixed on the Father, just like Peter had to have his eyes fixed on Jesus to walk on the water. Although, Jesus, although Peter began to sink, Jesus had grace for him. Peter, please to be saved. Save me. Do you know, even in our adventures in faith, there are, there are times it don't go so good. There are times of sacrifice. There's, you know, it's it just the way it is. But better one day in your presence than a thousand elsewhere. Amen. I'm going to close with this psalm. Psalm 21. Uh, Psalm 121, Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where did my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel, Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He watches over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. What a, what a comforting scripture. How wonderful. You know, doesn't that stir up a fresh boldness to say, yeah, we can forget God's got us. I forget. I forget sometimes. Hang on. God's, I have to pinch myself and say, hang on. Stop it. God's, God's got me. God has got me. He loves me. He delights over me with joy. He loved me. He sent his son to die for me. He's cleansed me and redeemed my life. He's calling me out and calling me into something for his glory. Wow. Yes, Lord. Forgive my apathy. Help me, to, help me to run into what you have, Lord. It's a faith walk. You might not know all the details of the itinerary, but the thing that matters is that you go and you go with God. Amen? Our God is an awesome God. Like I said, don't sit back. Don't be held back. Don't look back. Don't look back like Lot's wife and become a pillar of salt. Look forward. Trust God. Know that you've been called. Does your life reflect you've been called? Or are you just living your life the same as the bloke next door, really, just getting on with the busyness of the world? Let's love God. Let's trust God. Remember you were called. Abram, 75, said, yes, Lord. Awesome. Didn't know where he was going. Didn't even understand the call. Didn't
didn't understand the journey, he said, yes, Lord, let that be you. Let that be me, where we can say, yes, Lord. Okay, 2021, it's a clean page. Lord, what do you want? I want to be available for you. And if you're too busy, make yourself available for the Lord. Starts off with your personal relationship with God. God bless your heart. I encourage you. Join us next time as we continue to walk with Abraham. We continue to see how this call worked out on his life and our life as well. God bless your heart. I'll see you next time. Don't forget, go on to our social media sites. Go on to the websites, Effective Life Church, Effective Life Ministry. Don't forget, watch some of the other series here that we've done in the past that will bless you. And I encourage you, please share. Share the video. If you've been blessed by it, let it be a blessing to somebody else. Take care.